the modern day music business is not ideal for someone in my position in the music business, but that's why I'm very grateful that I have used my business experience and my relationships and my all the skills that I've learned as an independent DIY producer, team builder, and so on and so forth to now have have been able to invest all of that knowledge and time and experience into a different business that has nothing to do with music. All right, so uh, how you doing today, man? Ed Soul from Dope, how are you, man? I'm good, buddy. How about yourself, man? It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure, pleasure. I wish it was in person, but uh, I know you're out in Texas right now, and I'm out in the Poconos, so uh, couldn't make that happen I'm in, in person. LA. You're in L.A. now? Yeah, I live in L.A. Oh, shit. That's not what I heard from never... uh, Kevin. Oh, you know what? I was probably on tour. Oh, okay. That makes when sense. When you were talking to him. Yeah, that makes sense. I've never been a Texas guy. I was uh, My band got started in New York, and then I spent a bunch of years in Chicago. And then uh, L.A. has been my home for the last 10 years, dude. So time flies. It's just crazy. Wow. And where where in L.A. are you? Up in the valley, like valley. like West Hills, Woodland Hills. I, I never thought in a million years I would live out here. Um, L.A. has never really been my scene. But um, just, uh, you know, follow life, man. <laughs> yeah, wherever it may take you sometimes, right? Yeah. For sure. Yeah, man. So, uh, real quick, I don't know if you're aware of this part or or how it ended up, but uh, you guys released a couple of singles, getting ready for Blood Money Two to come out uh, ne- uh, early next year, to my understanding, right? Sometime in February. Correct. Cool. Um, there's a third single. If you go on Apple Music, have you know? Are you aware of this? On Apple Music. Yeah, on Apple Music. What's this, it called? This is funny to me. Kalishnikov, and it is a. It says that it's featured. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It 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 might be uh, mixed in with it from a different artist, is what I'm get, gathering. Yeah, it, you know, it's a weird thing. It's like you, you you'd uh, you'd be surprised how many rappers just decide to call themselves dope, and then release shit, and then you have to like go through the process of notifying all the different entities that like, hey, like. There's already an act called this, and this is not them. And then gotcha. it's a process. It's never quick and easy. Um, but yeah, I've been dealing with that shit my whole career. It's That's stupid, crazy man. I had no idea. So like, we're about to have this conversation. Last week, I'm I'm uh, in talks with Kevin getting it together, and so I'm like, all right, well, I'll go back and listen to some stuff. I know that they got some singles dropping, so I'll, I'll listen to the new stuff. And I go into <laughs> Apple Music Mall. It doesn't look right, but I'll listen to it. And I was like, man, this is really yeah. quite the departure. I mean, it was all in like Russian or, or, or something like that. Wow. <laughs> I was like, I, yeah, I don't yeah, think dude. this is the same the same uh, dope that I was looking for. <laughs> the fucking rappers just don't give a fuck, dude. They just like, they have no, they have no uh, concern with the law or like, you know, they're just like, I'm, I'm dope. But there's already a dope. Fuck them. I'm dope. <laughs> like, all right, dude. <laughs> you know, I just well, I, I, found, it, I found it very hilarious because I was listening and I was just yeah. like, it, it makes perfect sense when you describe it. And as you said, it takes so much time. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of the viewers at home might not understand. Like, you guys probably don't understand that. But like, yeah, it takes time to talk to the fucking people at Apple and get that shit fixed. So uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, now I, now I brought it to your Apple. attention. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's funny because I, I I've I heard of this one and we we did the we've gone through the proper channels on Spotify. I'm okay. not sure if they've taken it out yet, but yeah, man, you got to go through the process with YouTube and Spotify and and Apple and like everywhere. It's just you know who has enough hours in a day to chase annoying shit like no, that. That so, sounds that sounds. Uh, but it's funny. I, I I get um I'm a little bit of a troll troller. Um, every now and then, like I, I'll go on and I, I just like to give it. I don't, I don't care what people do on their forums, but like when you come to my forum, you come to like a Facebook or an Instagram or, or, or somewhere, a channel that I own and you just start talking shit. I feel like every now and then I need to go and put people in their place just so they know that like, you know, this is my place. You can't come to my house and just like say 
a bunch of negative shit about me. Um, so sometimes I like to do that. And, uh, and, and I found myself in one with somebody probably a, a month ago where they were like, I just heard the new dope and it's, I'm so disappointed. It's such a departure and this and that. And this, and I was like, dude, <laughs> what are you talking about? And yeah, we haven't even out, released anything. <laughs> yeah. He was talking about that song. He's like, dude, he, and as he's going back and forth with me and he, you can see that he's like going, why, why, why he's going, but, but it, it sounds like you're rapping in Russian. And I'm like, Oh dude, <laughs> You're completely confused. And he's like, I'm so sorry. And I felt bad because I kind of hammered the guy out the gate. But um, yeah, yeah, dude, shit's silly. So are you, um, so I, as I said, I noticed it on Apple music because that's, that's my, my means of, uh, of listening. I chose Apple music a long time ago when Spotify was still having trouble getting some of the artists over there. I mean, this is years ago now. Are you predominantly Spotify or Apple or do you have both? Um, predominantly spotify and and we're giving this record away for free too i heard that so, so uh, i was gonna ask about that it seems a, a little I, i'm very curious about uh about this so i understand you're releasing it digitally for free uh as long as the fans sign up at your website right and then correct and then they'll still be able to purchase like a hard copy uh if they want if to they want sure. i don't know i don't know who does that anymore but uh <laughs> unless it's vinyl i guess vinyl vinyl still right. does it yeah vinyl's cool yeah yeah um i'm curious though what's i imagine it's uh it's a digital package though too you'll have like the artwork and everything like that like itunes uh kind of sells but it it's having it downloaded and an actual a digital copy rather than just streaming it uh from spotify or apple i understand right Yes, and it, it, it does a couple things. Um, one is because of the, the way that we're releasing the record, we're not just like putting it all out in one day. Um, we were, uh, we're sort of, we dropped two songs when we made the announcement, and then we're going to drop a song like every three weeks until we get to the actual release date, which just technically means that all of the songs have been released at that point. Okay. Um, so, so if you go to the website and you sign up, um of course you get the digital art and all that crap but also every single time we release a song they just email it to you so you don't have to look for it you don't have to like you just if you sign up you're kind of like in the system and we'll send you it regularly and it just i don't know to me it just made it easy and i thought uh, it's also a cool way like I, i'm i'm as diy as you get and i have been mm. for, for many years now and it just i i, I like the term band to fan it removes anybody in between the the transaction between the band and the fan. Um, and obviously it's a free transaction, so I'm not asking them for any money, but it allows them to go directly to my system, put their information in, and then I can connect with them for, uh, for obviously for the, for the record that they signed up for. But also now it's like, you know, when we're touring, I can reach directly out to the, that person and let them know what's going on. Or if I want to offer them something that I don't want to offer everybody else or offer to them sooner. It's we haven't we haven't really established it as like, you know, a VIP fan club or anything like that. But that's how I kind of look at it in my head. Um, it's just a way for me to stay in contact with the people that I know really do give a fuck. Um, you know, I, I'm sure the people that listen to us on Spotify give a fuck too. We built a pretty awesome audience there. I'm kind of blown away by by the size of our audience on Spotify. Um, yeah, I saw, but, uh, I saw a you know, statistic that said uh, you don't need to boast about it, but I'll do it for you here. Uh, a statistic that said that you're in the top one percent of all the bands uh, globally being streamed right now. It's kind of crazy. We have almost 2 million monthly listeners, man. Mm -hmm. And I got like, you know, one of our biggest tracks is uh, this, you know, silly Die Motherfucker Die song that we recorded 20 years ago. And it's got, you know, 100 million plays. It's going to hit 200 million here in the next probably year or two. Like, it's just but bananas. And, and again, because we're such an indie DIY entity, it's not like we're doing anything to pump those numbers. It's just... You know, we've, we've built it over 20 plus years and we just have this cool connection with, with a certain group of people that just keep coming back and, and participating. So I'm super grateful for that. Um, but it was kind of unexpected. I don't know why our Spotify is, is so robust, but I'll take it. Yeah, man. I think that's a cool idea uh, to utilize the email list and stuff like that to uh, reach out to the fan base. And as you said, some kind of like a 
VIP fan club. Uh, yeah. Our, yeah. Our, ourselves have been working on one that's going to be more geared into the Web3 world. And uh, that's, I mean, that's, it's exactly what you're talking about, being able to drop new things when we want um, directly to that fan club. Um, and it is that, I never heard the term uh, band to fan, kind of like farm to table, right? But uh, that, yeah. I, I like that. I, that's the first time I've heard that. It's like hand to hand combat. I yeah. call it, you know, band to fan combat. I like it's that. not actually combat. If it's all right yeah. with you, I, I, I might I might steal that uh, moving forward. Uh, that, that's a pretty good. Hey, I, I'm used to I'm used to it, bro. It's all good. <laughs> a lot of people have been biting it's on all you. Good. <laughs> I, I mean, dude, you've been doing this shit for 25 years and you're, you know, and you're I don't want to call myself prolific, but I have my moments. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like, yeah, what I like is when, when, uh, like you just said, which I appreciate and, and I'm not looking for royalties or credit everywhere, but there's a few dudes that I've, you know, that I've come across through the course of my career that have had long careers like me. And, it, and at some point maybe really popped off. I don't want to mention any names, but, um, but like, I see them and they're like, dude, that's all. I love you to death. And like, man, when we toured with you back in the day, of course, these are bands that opened for us back in the day. And now they're fucking huge. Mm. And they're just like, dude, I stole so much shit from you. And I'm like, I know you did. I watched you on stage and you stole my whole thing. But like, <laughs> I don't give a fuck because you're killing it and it's not a competition. Um, I've got a, another one that you can, you can have, uh, for me to win, nobody has to lose. And I really believe that in music, that that's the case. And and I think a lot of us grew up in a time where we thought we had to compete with each other. 100%. And we thought that like, oh, we're going to go on stage and blow them away. It's like we all thought that when we were kids and we were insecure and we were trying to make our way. But once once I once I made my way and, and got a little more mature, I really did realize that, that like there's enough for everybody. It's not a competition. This isn't a fucking sporting event like for for uh, for me to be successful in life or in music or anything like it doesn't have to crush anyone else it doesn't have to stop anyone else from being just as successful and, and chasing their dreams so um you know that's that's another big one that i live by and i try to pass on to others well i i mean that's you you nailed it though man that's so true uh bands like us growing up and relative same time and uh you're absolutely right i, I remember uh, the competition aspect of it was so heavy. So on. stupid. And it's like, and it, it, and looking back and having hindsight 2020 or having hindsight vision on it, um, it, it's, it's pretty remarkable, like to think that we ever thought that way. Like it was, yeah. <laughs> it was like, oh, but we got to be better. We got to be better. It's like, it's art. It's art, people. Right. <laughs> like, like you could just fucking. Well, and, and it, it, it there's further, something like, for everybody here. Like it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> And when you're on like a cool tour with yeah. other cool bands that are just out there throwing their thing down, it's like, like if you look at it from the fan perspective, the fans don't give a fuck. Like no. they don't care whose name is above who's on the bill. They don't care if like, oh, I'm not, you know, there's guys out there I know that have these, you know, I call them the Peter Pans, you know, they just never fucking grew up. <laughs> They're like, even to this day, it's like my band's not going to play underneath that band it's like what is what does that even mean like dude yeah. shut up are you getting paid what you're supposed to be paid are you comfortable with that stop looking at the fucking ad mat and worrying about who's playing after you like you're so trivial and silly um so like the fans don't care about that shit all they care about is they went to this show and they saw these six or however many bands and they had a great time and I would like for every band on the bill to fucking blow you away because it means that you had an amazing experience that you got to walk away from going, Oh, I got my money's worth. Like that was a great night for me and my friends. Um, especially nowadays, I feel like everything's, even though everything's more immediate and the world seems to be more convenient in many ways, but like, I don't know, maybe it's just I'm older, but I, I actually, and, and our fans are older too. Now I, I really appreciate the effort that fans go through now to come to shows like you gotta get a fucking babysitter and take the next day off of work and like pay five dollars a gallon for gas it's like it's it's a whole lot of shit that goes into it so um i want to give them the most for their money and that doesn't just include you know me it's the whole package and, and everybody just you know yeah the competition stuff is just it's very immature it's very silly and 
you know, I understand why we went through that phase as young dudes. Because right. again, why do most get into music to begin with? It's because there's some insecurity somewhere. We're looking for validation <laughs> somewhere. I have no idea so what course, Edsel's talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course not. So, so of course you get a bunch of dudes that have that same mentality, and they're young and they're trying to make their way. They're going to have a competitive element to them. But yeah. you know, I think we've all lived beyond it. I'm grateful for the wisdom that has allowed me to realize how fucking meaningless all that shit is. It's just wasted energy. Absolutely. And I, I, I don't know, but it seems like that's not really happening in the upcoming bands either. And, and more further to your point about when the fans out there having their one night off and, ex and wanting that whole experience, they're not looking at the bands that are up there. Um, as competition that they're they're thinking these guys right. are out partying together having a good a time family. every night they're a family they're they've chosen each other and stuff and a lot of times as you know that can be the case it's also booking agents stuff like that i mean there's so many different ways that those uh bills come together obviously but for them sure. they don't know any of the business side of it they're just looking at it and they're like these bands like each <laughs> they other don't and care. They play together you know they, yeah, yeah and that's totally. if they even even take the time to think of that which they most often do not <laughs> right yeah no i agree 100% man like i uh you know i i don't know about the competition of the young kids meaning like the bands um i think they're still again i think anybody that's and I'm not using this word in a derogatory manner, but like anybody that's immature, anybody that's like in their early twenties, is playing rock and roll. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, they're probably going to fall into some of the same pits that we all did, but about, uh, man, I'm getting old about 10 years ago. Now is I think 2015. Um, I did warp tour for the first time. That was your first and warp tour was that, in 2015. No, I, I, I did warp tour with an, with another project that I did that um, nobody really knew about. I, I wore a mask in the project. It was called Drama Club. We were we did, we okay. toured the world with Black Veil Brides and Falling in Reverse, and it was just okay. kind of. Uh, there's a long story behind this, which I I won't bore you with, but um, I, I did all this for for very you know kind of creative, but also personal reasons. I, I built this electro kind of house project that was just nuts, like. Um, called Drama Club. You can find it. It's fucking nuts. But, no, um, they'll, they'll but we did Warped Tour. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. No, we'll get back to that. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just surprised that would be your oh, it's all good. first Warped Tour there. But it's the first Warped Tour you did with Dope. I know. It was my, I did this with Drama Club. I never did Warped Tour with Dope. Oh, that, that was in 2015. I'm sorry. 2015. Okay, okay, Correct. cool. Um, and, and so there were two things that happened on that that were cool for me. One is I wore a fucking mask all the time. Because I part of the appeal and part of the reason I was doing Drama Club was just to get the fuck away from everything I had done. I wanted no connection. I didn't want anybody to know who I was. Fans, bands, everything. Wow. So because I have a little bit, you know, enough notoriety in my own career, even on Warp Tour that was geared towards a younger crowd, I had to be super careful not to show my face because, you know, there's fucking people in the industry, like I'm going to run into somebody who's going to be like, dude, why is Edsel on Warp Tour? And then everybody's going to know. Um, and I didn't want that. I really wanted my anonymity. Um, but uh, but the two things that, you know, both the fans and the bands out there, but especially the fans, like what an awesome experience it was to connect to like the youth of that moment. Because, you know, when Dope came out in 1999, we were geared towards a very youthful audience. Like, you know, 16, 17, 18 year olds were fucking bananas. That was that was the movement that we were part of. So when I did Drama Club in 2015 and did Warp Tour, it was very similar where, you know, we're out with Black Bell Brides and Asking Alexandria and Falling in Reverse. And it's the crowd is just full of 16, 17 year old kids. So I got to connect with an and again, behind a mask where nobody knows who the fuck I am or how old I am or what I'm all about. So I, I really got to peer voyeuristically, like peer into like this whole new scene of youth and energy and kind of get my finger on the pulse of what those fans were digging on. And it was just a really cool kind of a human experiment. Like I've been doing a few of these human experiments as I've gotten older just to like get outside myself and experience things in a way that, um, you know, you know how it is, dude, like. People have a certain, it's one of the reasons that I did that. Uh, I don't know if you saw this little infomercial thing I did for the new album. It's about eight or 10 minutes long, but it's kind of a, kind of walks you through everything my life is now. 
because I've been such a private person the last 15 years or so that, that um, you know, I kind of came to realize that most people don't have a clue what I'm about and, mm. and what they think I'm about is based on very dated information from when I was in a metal edge magazine 18 <laughs> years ago so and we all have a clue. Yeah. And we all know how those, uh, those interviews and journalistic integrity went back. Yeah. Back <laughs> which, w which is awesome. Like, I mean, yeah. those, those were, you know, when social media came along, I really wasn't interested. And I think it's because Same. again, I had grown out of my theater fan. And I wasn't really interested in going, hey, look at me. And hey, this is what I'm eating today. And this is my, like, it just didn't appeal to me. Um, but back in the day, you know, normal press and journalism, um, you know, we were, we were a very big part of it because the band had heat. Um, but once that shift took place, I kind of tapped out. Um, so I think a lot of the perspective that people had on me was very, uh, very dated and very inaccurate. So that's why I did that little introspective um, little piece that I put out just to kind of re re engage and, and reintroduce myself to the world. Um, the fans, not so much, just the world in general. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Anyway, I uh, I forgot where the hell I was going with this. But um, we're talking about playing in front of the younger crowd, reconnecting with the younger crowd out on Warp Tour, doing that uh, that drama uh, was it drama theater. I'm drama sorry. club drama club i'm so sorry uh yeah yeah you're talking about no, that's that. all good we called it electronic music theater electronic music <laughs> theater that, i knew there was a theater in there somewhere you said yeah <laughs> in, instead of it being instead of it being edm you know electronic dance music like everybody talked we were like fuck edm we're emt we're electronic music theater so it was <laughs> it was cool it, we got i got a lot out of it we toured the world with it i made a lot of really good friends um you know, it was uh, definitely a cool experience, but but really awesome to go out there and play with all those younger bands and Warp Tour. I never realized how eclectic it was because right. I mean, I'd never done it before. But holy shit, man! Like you know, we were out with fucking Riff Raff. Like, yeah. I don't even know who that dude is. Nah. But like, I mean, just what a banana land bill that was. Yeah. Uh, crazy. So it was a lot of fun. I love doing those Warp Tours. We did them earlier on. So, but uh. I, did you pick up anything from these ba uh, younger bands though? I mean, like, like you said, you're kind of anonymous back there behind the mask, but you're connecting with, you know, a, a new fan base in 2015. You know, we like to think that we're a little bit younger than we are sometimes or, you know, and look back and like, Oh, it's only been 15 years, but 15 years is kind of a while. Um, when you're thinking about it, when you're talking about a demographic, right? Those, those 16 to 18 year olds are now, you know, coming up on 30 they're not, you know, that you, sure. that you grew up with. So now if you're looking more at 16, 18 year olds, again, in 2015, you're, you're seeing a, a new breed of bands connecting with that. Like you mentioned in uh, asking Alexandria and, and Black Veil Brides. Do, did you see any um, similarities to when you were coming up or anything that you were like, man, I wish I would have done that when we were coming up? No, because I feel like, you know, times change so much. I mean, like when we were coming up, we were right on the pulse of what was happening at the time. I mean, dude, MTV and, and uh, you know, media as a whole, like the genre that we were in was on the cover of Rolling Stone. You know, MTV Spring Break Beach House had fucking Fear Factory playing. So right. it was like it, it was all we were we were part of that. So. I didn't really learn anything from that perspective. Um, two things happened. I, again, I got to I got to connect with a, an entirely new generation of fans, which was really cool. Um, even if it was, you know, done in a way that was, you know, anonymity and, and they didn't, but because they were connecting with Drama Club, not dope. That was the whole point, right? Um, and even sonically, like what we were building with Drama Club was was very different. Um, but. Uh, but I became fans of some bands that I had never really, really been a part of. Like, you know, we, we toured with Black Veil Brides before we did the Warp Tour. And I knew nothing about those dudes other than they were like, they looked like Motley Crue shout at the devil. And truthfully, and I, I say this with all due respect, they were hard to take seriously for a guy that's a little older. I was looking at him going like, what is this goofy shit? Like, mm -hmm. I've seen this before. And then I got on the road with them. And I saw, first off, I saw the way the fans reacted to them. And I was like, holy shit, like, you can't buy that. You can't fake that. Like, that's fucking real. So that instantly changed my perspective to, to, to just be more open. And then I, and then sonically, 
they like, and I told Andy this I, like after a few shows, I was like, dude, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but like, you guys remind me of fucking Bon Jovi. Like, it's a, it's a very, like, it's very geared towards young girls, but just even the way that your sonic, your, 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 your hooks connect with people, I was like, I'm very impressed. Like, I, I didn't, I didn't realize it because I, I didn't, I didn't investigate it. I didn't even give myself a chance to like go down the rabbit hole to see why is this working. But, um, but I got it and I, and I respect those dudes for that. But, but the one dude I became a really, really big fan of, and I think I got to the, to the party a little early because now he's fucking blowing up was Ronnie Radke from falling in reverse. Okay. Another dude that very misunderstood dude that like, you know, even creatively, like a lot of people think they know, but man, what a talented fucking kid. Like he's not a kid anymore, but like to me is like, what a voice, what a songwriter, um, what self-belief, what an interesting story. Um, turned out that, you know, we were on tour with Ronnie and he fucking lived a block and a half away from me. Like no shit. Oh, I was really? like, dude, you live literally. So he just started, you know, he'd come <laughs> over to my, my parties and like, we became, I don't want to say buddies, but we became buddies. And, um, what a, what a good guy. Like, I know he's had some weird shit in the past. And like I said, he's very misunderstood for, you know, being very, rock and roll and double middle fingers which i can relate to but um just super talented what a great fucking singer and now they're dude they're out there co-headlining with papa roach playing you know sheds doing fucking ten thousand people at night it's like you know god bless him for for all that so he's he's a guy that i i got to really become a fan of and you know some of those bands i'd never heard of pierce the veil like what great songs what an interesting mm. thing that they they put together and so I know it was just a cool, it was a cool little departure to just, you know, to just get outside and, and be around youth and be around what's happening. And you, you know what that's like when you've been in a band and established yourself in a certain box, very hard to even, not even to, to be reimagined, but just to have opportunities to be, to be on the same bill with younger bands playing to a different audience. Like it, it's, it's virtually impossible. So the only way that, and it, it wasn't my intention, my intention when building Drama Club was it was always supposed to just be like these late night, drugged in, crazy house parties that we started in Chicago. And I moved out to LA and I just started sharing what I was working on with different people in the industry. And Rob Blasco, who manages Blackville Brides and plays in Aussie, yeah, yeah, I know Blasco, he saw Drama Club and he was like, dude, this is such a cool thing. Like, I want to be part of this. And I Did was like, at one of all these right, parties? Wow. Did you see it at one of these parties you're describing? No, no. He, he, he came over to my studio okay. because I had known Rob for, for many years and, and I was just playing. I was, he was like, what are you working on? So I played him new dope and I played him, um, some other stuff that I was producing. And, um, and then I was like, Oh, and I got this one weird thing that I'm kind of developing. We've been doing these crazy house parties in Chicago and it's, you know, and I, and I played it for him and he was like, wow and he called me literally 30 minutes later he leaves my my studio and he's like bro Shit. i want to be involved in this and i was like well how do you fit in he's like hear me out i want to put you on tour with blackfield prize and i was like wait <laughs> a minute dude like this is not where this belongs at all he's like yeah but you'll be in front of kids and i was like that's interesting and then and then it became like even though it's not where it was supposed to end up it was like is this an, is this an interesting detour that we want to take and i was like all right fuck it like how often do you get a chance to go out there and play to a completely different audience and be in a sold out room every night because that particular tour they offered us was black veil verizon falling in reverse it was like oh, okay. that tour is going to be a, out of that's control a, yeah it's a big one yeah so so we took that and it was very much a detour from everything that we that we planned to do with that project but like i said i'm, I'm grateful for it um it was a good time and good departure and uh you know just something that most people don't even know that I did, but I spent three years of my life touring the world and just wearing this fucking mask and just being being on another planet. I love that, by the way. That you just threw on a mask and went out there and did that. That's that's fucking yeah. That's such a departure. And like you said, it's like human experiment. You know, is are you pointing, yeah. is that the mask up there? What mask is that up there above the windowsill? Is that a Mike Myers? I can't really tell. Oh, no, no, that's that's Frankenstein. The, oh, Frankenstein. The, next to it though is that is. Yeah, next to it is a warp tour plaque that you can't really see, gotcha, but that's yeah, actually yeah. Drama Club back there. Um, but yeah, it, uh, if you if you go to YouTube, there's a video you can watch called Maniac. It's just a 
fucking crazy time, man. And then some of those tracks that like demos, because we, we made so much music during that time. We were just, you know, kind of going nuts. Uh, most of it was, you know, very club orientated. But then we started writing more like just kind of new wave uh, inspired stuff just so that we could start putting some vocals on it. But we didn't release much of it. Um, and some of those demos wound up finding their way onto the new dope record which is partially why we chose to call the new dope album blood money part zero instead of blood money part two um a couple reasons for that one is that my name in drama club was zero um but then also because so much of the music was written in the same time period as blood money part one and then these drama club demos that became dope songs were written prior to blood money part one that it just felt appropriate to kind of make this a prequel and bring that little bit of drama club spice into dope um you know because it had been years now and i i I wasn't concerned with connecting them anymore because i wasn't the anonymity didn't matter to me anymore Mm. like i had already completed the human experiment so i didn't need to uh to keep them separated but when i was doing it it was it was absolutely important that i kept them separated so that i i wasn't walking around uh the warp tour grounds as Edsel Dope. Like I, yeah. I did it like that defeated the entire purpose. So Dude. it was good. I must have been I mean that must have been so fun though, honestly, just being able to do that. That that sounds like a great experience. It was very hot though, because I was covered. <laughs> I was gonna say yeah the man yeah. <laughs> I've talked, yeah, to, some like, guys, you know, yeah, talked to some other guys you know yeah I've talked to some other guys in bands that wear masks. I mean back in the day I used to tour the mushroom head and then done some stuff with slipknot yeah. and stuff and like like yeah, it's awesome, yeah, it was, except it for that one bit. On yeah, floor. one pain in the ass. Is yeah. like, it's fucking extra hot in there. But um, uh, back to uh, uh, Blood Money uh, Part Zero. Uh, you said that some of these stuff from uh, from drama from Drama Club were on there. Is that is that uh, some of the I don't know keyboard electronic stuff happening in, in Believe? There is that part of it? Yeah, like 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 i mean dope has always had that electronic element to right. it um but but the but the song believe in particular was a demo that was for drama club okay. that just like never never got fully realized and i and and you know the subject matter of the song like you know a lot of people have their own idea of what they think dope is but you know we've released 100 plus songs since the band's been around and 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 every album after our first album has actually been very wide. I mean, we've had some of the you know most brutal bangers that you can have, and then four songs later, there's a fucking acoustic song because right. I never wanted to be in a box and feel like as an artist I would like write something or feel something and then say like, oh, but you know that's not dope. It's like, bro, like if, if it's me, it's dope. Like if it's in my soul, it's dope. So I, I, I very early on in my career, I sort of set that. So. um So with the Believe song, um, you know, as I was going through the older stuff and figuring out, uh, you know, what did I want to complete? Because that's another problem with me because I'm the producer and I'm the artist and I even and I even mix the records. Um, I have so much control that it actually sometimes works as a hindrance to me because it, it forbids me from being able to get to a point where, like, I actually finish stuff because until i say it there's no one there's no deadline there's no one going like dude this has to come i'm like it's not done it's not coming out right so i have so much unfinished work on on the hard drives like i you know probably another hundred songs just sitting there that are waiting for a bridge or waiting for me to finish the lyric of the second verse because i just haven't gotten there yet right um so um hold on a second my my earbuds are telling me that they're gonna die and i have a backup over here one second. I'm sorry, dude. Yeah, yeah, I'm an no, asshole. You're all good. No, 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 no. Uh, what the fuck did I do with... <laughs> I like that you had... I mean, I've been in that situation too, man. I know I had the backup. It's right there, ready to go. And then shit... Yeah, happens. no shit. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to pull it off of uh, of uh, a Bluetooth and just go to speed. That's cool, man. Me? What's up, man? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Funny enough, it actually sounds a little... Oh, wait a minute, it's my fault. There you are. All right, you got yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, No, I got you. Funny enough, it's got, a little, it's got a little bit more baritone in the voice now. It's going to be a nice little, like... We, you, you're All just right. talking about how you mix dope records, and now you just mix your own uh, voice here on the uh, on the Drinks with Johnny podcast. It's my low-end power. It's bad. <laughs> um, 
So, so yeah, so I got all this fucking unreleased music and, um, and I was just kind of going through stuff and, and trying to decide what I wanted to finish. And the believe song was very obvious to me very early on and partially just because of, of being older and like, you know, going through like, I don't want to take you on another journey, but oh no, please do. You, you, you don't don't cut yourself off, uh, uh, Ed. So if, if anyone needs to cut somebody off, don't worry. All about right, it. <laughs> you, you All go. Right, fair enough. You go, man. So, so yeah, like one thing that happened to me, dude, and and again, it's part of the Peter Pan syndrome that I like to talk about that most guys in bands go through. Like yeah. being in a band is like it's fucking designed to make you immature and keep you immature and stunt you from growing, you know, uh -huh. the way we live on the road, you know, and, and when you're the, I hate to use this word, but it's true. Like when you're the boss as I am in my organization mm. um, and you're young, so let's go back to, you know, 2000 fucking three, 2005 with me, whatever it is like, okay, so, so I own the band, I'm the boss. We have some heat. We're playing to big crowds. Um, I got into this for, you know, as an insecure dude looking for validation, like most of us are, of course, I'm an artist and I got something to say as well. And then you add girls and booze to the mix and you begin, you, you, and if, and if you start to believe it, which I did because I was special, I was like, Hey, I'm fucking Edsel in this cool band and all these girls like me and look at me doing what I do. Like, um, you start to believe that. And again, when you're the boss everybody works for you, you, you begin to just kind of, or at least I did, I began to just walk on, walk over people. Like mm -hmm. you begin to just kind of push any, anything that challenges you, you just push it out. Like, well, I don't fucking need your opinion. Like, and what it did for me, and it, and it took me several years to come to realize it just kind of made me like a shitty person. Like it made yeah. me like, I was still very successful and I was still able to accomplish the things that I wanted to accomplish. But like, I wasn't the best friend. I certainly wasn't a great boyfriend. Mm. Um, I just, you know, and, and when I look back at it, it's all immaturity. It's all just being a Peter Pan and and not wanting to grow up. And, and I kind of came to a realization at, at one point in my life where I was like looking in the mirror and going like, dude, you're not like your mother would not be proud of a lot of the ways that you function like, and, and that's a big deal for me. Cause I was raised by a single mom. And, mm -hmm. um, so for me to like come to that realization that like, yeah, your mom's proud of your success and she's proud that you made it in this incredibly difficult industry. But like, would she be proud of the way that you treat the people that you're closest to in your life? Or like, not really, like you're, you're not, you're not hitting it out of the park in that area. So, um, that's I had a hard to, thing to realize, man. Yeah, dude. So I really had to start working on myself and like trying to make my emotional maturity match my professional maturity. Right. And, um, and you know, and most of that comes from loss. Like you like ruin a relationship that you really cared about and you go like, why did that happen? And you, yeah. you self reflect and you will, cause you were an asshole is why that happened. So yeah. that's what you get. Every, 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 yeah. And everyone, every once in a while, if they're honest, they need a slap upside the head every once in a while to, to learn 100%. From, to learn from and grow. 100% dude. But for me, I think a lot of that reason was like the character of Edsel Dope and like the energy that the band puts out on mm. stage or, or you know, it, I had a hard time separating from from the guy, from the character. Right, 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 right. And and again, with, with Dope, it was like very sex, drugs and rock and roll, very like, you know, double middle fingers and, and, and you know, very easy to be misunderstood. But again, when I started out, it was like, Ooh, I'm going to, I'm going to be this. And then I became that. And then I, and then it became me. Right. And that's what I, I, again, after doing that for a few years and realizing, well, I got to dial this back. Cause that's not really who I am. Like, sure. Elements of this are in my personality that I, you know, just put on steroids and exploited. Yeah. But like, just turn the volume it, up on that, on the, everyone has different yeah. personalities. It's not, it's not always, you know, a, a, a clinical right. thing. Everyone's got different personalities, right? And you, you choose the one that you're, that you turn up to bring out on stage, you know? Right, exactly. And which is cool. And, and I, you know, but now I've learned how I can leave it on stage and like, it doesn't, it doesn't define who I am. Right. Um, so Separate I, I kind of got brought to this point by the song believe like just the subject matter of the song, you know, it, it's, it's very reflective of like that story of like, 
you know, life and love and loss and growth through realizing that like you, you, you know, what really matters at the end of the day. Mm. Um, so, um, so it was good, you know, I, I, I didn't expect when I started writing that song, you know, eight, 10 years ago, whatever it was that it would ever find its way to having double bass and electric guitars on it. <laughs> um, it wasn't meant to be that, but once it did get all that, I was like, man, it's even fucking better. And now it translates. I feel like it actually is a completed thought now. And the, you know, emotionally, the lyrical content of it, it's, it's definitely my story. There's, you yeah. know, there's no, there's no confusing that, but that's kind of part of the, the, the overcoming the Peter Pan syndrome wow. that again, I think a lot of dudes, you know, and it's weird too, man. I know dudes to this day that are fucking close to 50 years old. And I, you know, you're like, Hey, how you been, man? It's like, Oh fuck, that dude is still Peter Pan. And you try yeah. to tell them. And they're just, you know, they just believe it still. But it's yeah. like, I don't know, man. I'm, That's I'm not so, that deep. It's so interesting to hear you say, I didn't know that we were, uh, that this is where the conversation was going to go. Because honestly, as you, I, I don't know if you're aware, we just fucking have a conversation on this podcast and just see where it takes us. But uh -huh. it's so funny because even listening to the song, I didn't understand quite uh, um, where it was going lyrically. And hearing you talk about the Peter Pan syndrome, hearing you... Uh, just describe those those very things of separating the stage and yourself, the, the different personas, the man, uh, just the growing up, the maturity of life. So many of these things are all things that I am going through literally right now um, over the last uh, couple of years. Something that I have, I have a young son now is five years old. Um, that shit humbles you. That shit figure, you know, it, it, totally. you know, you look in the mirror sometime and you're like, wow, I'm not the 23 year old party animal anymore. I mean, God, I still wish I was sometimes, but I'm just right. really not that guy anymore, you know? And it's right. like, and, and you realize you, through maturity, it, you don't fight it anymore. Right. You just realize and, and come to accept it and go like, it's just another chapter, you know, like those chapters are done. They were great. We had a lot of fun. You can attest to that. All the, all the drinking and having fun with all the girls doing, doing it all, man. Like <laughs> we, we came up in relatively same time with our, with our band. Yeah, dude, stuff. for sure. So, um, and I, I get attest to all that fun, you know, but it's like, you know, it's, and it's great. But now it's time to like you, you, we're we're we close that that part of the book. We're opening up this new one, and it's uh, it's good to realize that so you don't end up still uh yeah at, at Neverland, if you will. Yeah, fucking dinosaur, you know. But but it, but it's true though because the the industry that we're in it really does like inspire and perpetuate that kind of thought. Like I'm, I'm gonna it, I'm gonna play that epi I'm gonna play just that excerpt right there so it didn't come from my mouth and I'm gonna play that for my wife later on so it <laughs> awesome. it's I mean, not just bro, me babe it's it's not just an excuse <laughs> but dude but, but but the wives are a big part of like I I hate to use the word of like breaking us but like sometimes we need to be broken Absolutely. in order to like put ourselves back together in the mold that we were meant to be. Because if you 100%. leave us to our own devices, man, especially in the world that we live in on tour buses with, you know, with crowds of people reaffirming all of these things and putting us on pedestals and like, I, I don't care who the fuck you are. If you're in this for those reasons, if there's ego built in to how you're putting yourself on stage, which bands like ours, dude, there were just look at us, like, look at yourself, look at your band. Like, that's who a lot of us were. Um, you man, at some point you're probably going to need to be broken down to rebuild yourself because you just lose sight of like what's real and what's, and what, what's not important and what's important. And like, you 100%. know, uh, the whole well, thing. what's important is real. It, <laughs> yeah, know? that's true. It, it's stripping away. But it's all easy, but it's easy, bullshit. but it's easy Edzo, for us to uh, decide what reality is in our own perspective. And when, when sure. it's just, just through those things. So I just, it is what's real, but it's also, it's what are the important things and not to be morbid and, and not that we're complaining here again. I want to reiterate that we're not sitting here complaining. Oh, woe is me. It's just, this, these are just the realities of, of what we go through um, as being performing uh, uh, bands and stuff. So, uh, I bring all that up. Like at the end of the day, what do you want out of life? It, you're not, you ain't taking that 24 year old party animal with you. You're not, I mean, you're honestly, in my belief, you're not taking anything with you and you're probably just going into, into the darkness. But at the end of the day, what, what do you want to leave 
a lasting impression with. And well, and now matters. and now I'm gonna get now I'm gonna get super cheesy on you, and I'm gonna like quote the song lyrics from that song. Like you're it's precisely what it is. The the hook of the song is we live and learn, we die and burn. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I believe in love because that's where it all begins. Like if you don't have really? love in your life and in your heart, like you're just gonna wind up lonely and like miserable. Man, do and, it. yep. The only thing that's really it, important is your friends and your family. And those Dude. moments, all we really have are those moments with them, you know? So and also, and, and it's, it. it's too, to me, it's introspective too. It's how you feel about yourself. Like, right. you know, depression is a real thing too. Absolutely. And, and, and for, for people like myself, I, I don't want to, you know, to, to loop you into that, but like, I know that eating those like to, to coin your term, like the party animal lifestyle or whatever. Like if you just feed that, if that's your goal, it's like, I saw star Wars once for the first time and it was really good. And then I saw it again. Then I saw it again. And then I've seen it like 300 times and like the 300th time you've seen it, it's nowhere near as interesting and fun and fulfilling as it was the mm. first time and partying and being in that lifestyle that, you know, maybe we, we, we all chose, but like becomes your life becomes your, your groundhog's day. Like that shit can get really dark and depressing and like soulless and have, you know, no purpose. Um, you, it's like, you know, the sad clown, like, you know, you put on the makeup and you go out on stage and you entertain everyone, but then like, it's all over and you're, you're like, all right, now what do I do? That's a like, come down, I... man. That's a, that's one of those other things. A lot of people don't understand is getting off that stage is like coming off of a drug. Like it's, it's... which, which is again, why if, if you're going to go to the after party and you're going to turn the bottles back and you're going to keep it up, well that then you're in the same energy you were on stage. You just right. keep going with it. But if you go like, I don't want to do that. That doesn't bring me happiness. Then what do you do now? You're isolated and you're just like, well, how do I come down off that and get to a normalcy? So, you know, again, like you said, this is not a woe is me. This is more of like, this was self-reflection and finding out how to deal with my own demons and, right. and find peace. Um, but for me, it was it really had to break myself down and just kind of start over again. And, and the best way that I could interpret it was, like I said, looking in the mirror and going like, all right, what parts of myself would my mother be proud of and what parts of myself would my mother slap the shit out of me for? And like, let's work on those because yeah. I know my mother, she didn't raise a dummy, but she also didn't raise an asshole. Like I, yeah. I like, but I, but in many parts of my life, I kind of became an asshole and it's like, all right, well that's choices. So you can make different choices. You can repair some of the things that you've hurt and you can like get back to where you, the, the course of life that you would like to be on. So where, when you look in the mirror, you don't, you don't feel like there's things that you need to fix or I mean, we always have things to fix, but again, that's We're why it works in progress, back. man. Right. But that's why I keep coming back to that third party. Like my mom, yeah, I really yeah, totally. use my mom to like, if you can. And I also feel like that happens to us as, as men. Like I've learned so much about myself through the eyes of the women that I've been with through my life. And I don't mean the, like the women that didn't mean anything. I mean, the women in my life that did mean something to me, mm -hmm. like, and, and the, the way that they look at you when they're disappointed in you or happy in you or what have you, like I, I take a lot from that. So in the, in, in my darkest times, I was alone purposely because I had fucked things up and I needed to reset. So I needed someone to use as like the eyes to see myself through. And I, I chose my mom because well, who better than that? Um, and for me, it just really helped me like reset and, and, and kind of, you know, reestablish the man that I wanted to be and uh, just set myself on that course and made decisions based on the outcome that uh, I was looking to achieve on just being a good dude, being like the dude my mother raised me to be. And it wasn't that hard once I, you know, once I got that commitment to myself that that's what I wanted to do, um, just breaking some bad habits and, 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 you know, having to check myself, the depression was the hardest part. I think the isolation was the hardest part. Uh, just figuring that out. And I, and you know, I, I was open to everything. I went to a shrink and like, I got, they put me on prescription meds. I did all kinds of shit. And wow, then I, I prescription I, on it. Okay. Yeah. You know, part of it was at the time I had my, I had a relationship with, uh, with someone whose father was a doctor and super nice guy. All he was looking to do was help me out. But right. he was like, well, you know, Edsel, if you had a heart problem 
and I wanted to prescribe you this pill to help your heart, you would take it, right? I was like, sure. He's like, well, your brain's the same way. And I was like, okay, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. But at the time it made sense to me and I was searching for answers and and I trusted him. So, you know, he referred me to somebody and, and then, you know, they said, well, let's try this for you and let's try that for you. And I spent about two years of my life going through that process. And, um, I didn't, I didn't like it. I kind of got to the point where I was like, you know what? Like I, I think that the that that the work I was doing on myself was what needed to be done and all this other stuff was was support for it and I just kind of reached a point where I was like I'm I'm done I'm like I'm not going to do this anymore and I just quit and and I it sucked because you have withdrawals from that shit yeah it's really weird, but were you, but are I, you are you still regular with a therapist or was a therapist no. through that or you just took the pills and okay yeah, once I got off the pills, this is like eight or ten years ago now. Once, mm-hmm. once I, once I just poured them down the sink and was like, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, I stopped it all, and part of that was the I'm a big windshield guy versus rearview mirror, mm-hmm. and I think there's something symbolic about moving, and that was when I made the decision to move out to L.A. It was like, like Chicago at that point had nothing for me, and it was full of just like you know broken things and. It was a cold, very cold place to live. There's, there's a, there's a reason that you know seasonal depression is real. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Chicago, man, eight months of the year, it's just gray and miserable. And- I, I, I wouldn't be able to attest to that, except for as you know, I haven't actually lived in any of those places, like for in stationary. Right. But I've been on plenty of fucking long ass tours in the winter. Sure, and that's that's the same. It's brutal. Yeah, it's but yeah, bad. I spent I spent twelve years in Chicago, dude. Yeah, and like wow. I was there for all the right reasons, but but once I decided there was nothing there for me anymore, literally in a in a in a very short time span, I made up my mind to move and get off the prescription meds to leave the personal relationship I was in and the business relationship I was in. I just was like, none of this is working. I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to drive West and I'm going to look in the windshield and I'm going to let all this shit go to the rear view. And I'm going to, and all the work I've done on myself at that point had been like two years of work of like, you know, trying to figure it out. I was like, all of this is going to pay off in my pursuit of happiness and, and new goals and everything that, that I set out to move out to California and, and, and build this, this life. And now I'm, you know, 10 years into it. And, um, and by no means am am I perfect. Like I'm still, you know, figuring shit out, but, but it's been, you know, hundred percent the right decision and hundred percent, you know, on the path that I want to be on. Um, but you know, life is like you said, it's chapters, man. And like, it's sometimes to begin a new chapter, you really have to turn the page and let the other one completely go. Yeah. And, uh, that's been a big part for me. And, and drama club took place during that. Like the first thing I did when I got to LA was go like, well, I don't want to go and jump right back into the, you know, energy of being on a, a dope tour for two months, but I'll put on this mask and I'll go do this different energy so I can be in the familiar touring environment that I'm comfortable in and, and work on something creatively and artistically, but remove the energy that at one time was a detriment to my soul. Mm. Um, so I don't know if maybe that was helpful for me too, but, um, but it's all good, man. You know, I'm, I'm, I can't complain very grateful for the experiences and the opportunities that I've had. Um, you know, nothing beats hard work. And, uh, and like I said, I, I'm a big believer in, in those couple little dumb phrases of like, for me to win, nobody has to lose. Can't think of the other ones right now, but I just, uh, I'm not here to compete and I'm not here to, to hurt anybody else. I'm just here to do my thing and, and, uh, and try to surround myself with the right energy, people that have the right energy, right. which energies, energies become really important to me, not in a super goofy, you know, Zen way, but like you can pick up on people's energy and know that like, yeah, that guy might, I think that guy has opportunity around him, but I don't like his energy. Well, then I don't need his opportunity. Right. Whereas other times in your life, you might be like, yeah, I don't really like that guy, but, but, you know, he knows so-and-so and and that will help me get where I'd just rather figure out Uh, my own way and cut that out. 
Yeah, and I, I think that goes a lot of that goes back to just being a good person too, you know, sure. and and and, uh, and surrounding yourself with other like minded people as, as as often as you can, you know. I mean, that's yeah, you're always going to run into other people too, and you have to be prepared for that, you know, and just see it for what it is. And that's the other thing is, is uh, for me, it's to not get angry or upset with the people who have a different outlook on life or anything like sure. that. It's like, no, that's just that's 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 you. That ain't me. Yeah, that doesn't work for me, and, and, good, and, and good luck to you. Exactly, you know, and that's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's another thing I've realized, like, with that disposition, like, I have no enemies, bro. Like, mm -hmm. I have no, like, there's nobody on this planet that I wish poorly to, because right. I just remove, if, like, if your energy doesn't work for me, or your vibe doesn't work, it's like, all right, cool, dude, like, I'm just gonna go over here, and you yeah. do this, and it's all good. Yeah, absolutely, man. I don't need the wars. There's too much fucking energy in war. <laughs> no shit, man. Well, um, there's a couple of other things I wanted to get back to. Um, I did see that you are in this, uh, is it Echo or Eco uh, Studios? Echo. Echo Studios. Echo. This looks really cool, man. I looked at the website <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is some, this is some like next level, like was it 4D uh, imagery mapping and and shit like that. Uh, how did you get into this uh, company and, and what exactly is your role? Uh, well, I own it. Um, okay. Me and my, so I'm the COO and the, and the co-owner of the company. Um, it's a long story, which uh, I'll be happy to come back and talk with you about someday. Or I'll do it right now, but you'll be going like, dude, it's been an hour. Um, <laughs> no, no, don't, again, don't cut yourself off here, man. If you got something to do, cut yourself off for that. But no, I'm good. I, I, uh, then, then go, because I'm very interested in this, man. I really am. So e Echo is like, yeah, man, like the 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 shortest way to describe it is that we we create the assets to generate the most realistic digital humans imaginable. Mm -hmm. We're almost like, to put it in perspective, we're tapping your digital DNA, um, which uh, sounds weird, but like from a visual standpoint, there there's no other company that serves clients that is producing a 3D model that can rival ours. Now, Google can probably rival us, Facebook can probably rival us, um, you know, Sony, Epic, but none of those companies work on exterior projects. All those companies work on internal projects and internal right. projects only where we set our business model from the earliest onset to be client serving. So anyone can call us. And if you got the budget, you can come to us and work with us. Um, so we're on like the next level tip of delivering data that is on the next level, but doing it fully independently. Um, but I got involved in this uh, very much by coincidence. Um, my uh, when I first moved to LA, um, <laughs> uh, let me choose my words carefully there. Uh, <laughs> if we work with Disney and all this kind of shit, so okay. let's just say uh, so. One of my 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 neighbors who became my really good friend um, was in this business. Uh, he's actually the brains behind Echo Studios, my business partner, super talented, incredibly smart dude. Um, and uh, and we just identified through our friendship sort of like some things in my life that were missing, some things in his life that were missing. And one of the things that we both kind of shared was like, we're both missing a partner in business that was like our equal, somebody that we looked at and was like, man, like. I have business partners, but I feel like I'm always sitting at the end of the table and all these dudes kind of look to me for me to give them direction. And he and I were very similar. So we were like, well, what would happen if you and I sat in equal chairs and worked on something together and mm. just like went and took over? Um, and he was, again, very savvy with that business and with the tech side of it. So I took the approach with him of going like, here's what I would like to do with you. Like, Let's build this company and let me treat you the way I wish a manager at any point in my career would have treated me, which is I'm going to help surround you with all of the resources that you need, the team members that you need, 
and I'm just going to let you work. And I'm going to handle all the bullshit that gets in your way on a daily basis. I'm going to handle all the administration. I'm going to handle everything that's got to do with taxes and government and licenses. I'm going to handle the billing. I'm going to handle everything, the chasing down people that owe us money or in this industry, you know, you're constantly filling out, you know, contractor compliance forms and like, what you are know, con- what are contractor compliance forms? Well, like if you, if you work with a company that like is, you know, Disney or Sony or, or any of these monster companies, like they, they're constantly changing their ways of legally filing their contractor. I, I don't even, honestly, I, I don't even know how to describe it other okay. than there's lots of forms to fill out all the time. <laughs> okay. There's shit. Yeah. Of, shit. You don't want to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Just red, red tape minutia gotcha. okay. of administrative stuff that ultimately protects the, 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 the entity that is paying you from some form of legal issues. Okay. Um, and it can have to do with employees. It can have to do with contractors. It can have to do with, um, with data security, like there's so many different things because also we are working with like superstar triple A talent. I mean, yeah. you know, I saw the one with then, Terry Crews, uh, that looked incredible. That's like right there on yeah. the page at, at, at Echo Studios. And it's, and that's like weekly for us, you know, like yeah. Vin Diesel was in oh, recently. Sure. Like I could, I could list you a, a list of triple A celebrities. You'd be like, holy shit. Like there's, you know, it's, it's big people all the time. So, so and obviously we're capturing their digital dna which means that you know you could make their digital subject do some really goofy shit if you wanted to um <laughs> of course we would never do that but um but so so point being wait, 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 wait. I, wait. you would never do it publicly but do you guys fuck around behind the scenes no. with it? <laughs> no because no, because truthfully we never i mean we, I, we I would i would be very you know going back to the peter bear a little immaturity no, just as a joke like hey what if we did this no <laughs> No, and part of the reason too, though, is that we don't, we don't, we're not even in the biz. Like, we can create the models, but we're not even in that business. Like, and that's right. one of the places where I've been very strategic with what we do. Like, if you look at at the business we're in, we create the the puppet. Okay. Like when we when we do a, a a scan session, we're creating the digital puppet, but we're not making the puppet walk, talk, or or. That's a completely different entity and a completely different budget. And I call that the space race, honestly, because in the business that we're in, everybody's trying to figure out how to get a fully rigged, completed 3D model, you know, of the highest possible quality in the shortest amount of time for the shortest amount of money. Um, and, you know, that's what Meta and and Google and all those dudes, they're on their own space race to find their their path to success with that. Whereas what I feel like we're doing is we're making the rocket fuel. We're making the, we give them the assets that they can then put into their system and figure it out. And I'm not interested in getting to space. I'm just interested in making the best fuel. Um, so, but again, the way it worked out with me and my business partner was, was that was my goal. It was like to be the strategist because I'm really good at that, to be the guy that, in, in, that has the marketing head because I'm also really good at that. And I'm a killer team builder and like a, and, humbly like a really really good strong leader so for me to sit down with him and go all right this is the business model that we're going to put together and you know we started very small and now you know we're in a ten thousand square foot facility and we have 10 people on the team when it started it was just me him and one other guy um so we're humbly we're we're killing it right now Mm -hmm. But um, but a lot of that is is based in, of course, him being ultra talented and on the cusp of this technology, but then us being very diligent in what our business model is and what our strategy is. And again, me protecting him from all that minutia of insanity that can drag anybody from being like, oh, I'm creative and I'm doing this really cool thing and I got my team and now, oh, I got to do these these compliance forms and i've got to send invoices out to these people and and follow up on this and and you know everybody we work with you got to do an nda and there's just so much minutia um that that's that's me i'm that guy who handles all that shit and i keep my business partner focused on what he needs to do and he's like one of my best friends in the world and it's just really been a cool experience and for my whole career i've always had something outside of the band like i was one of the earliest dudes to the party back in the you know the the 
early 2000s where I was doing tons of what I call faceless music. Like I would do music for ESPN or for video games or for commercials. Like I was that dude and I had a really, really lucrative business. But the more that digital recording came to be affordable Mm -hmm. and the more music supervisors that had a 16 year old kid with Fruity Loops that just started going, Hey dad, here's this little thing I made. They're like, well, fuck, I'll just put that underneath the latest sports highlights. I don't need to pay somebody real money for it. So that business started to dry up. Um, I found myself uh, for a while working for a global marketing agency um, where I was the director of music development and entertainment working on, you know, really big programs. I, I did uh, all the music for the NFL one year and major league baseball and Jesus. Uh, yeah, worked on uh, worked on programs for Indian Motorcycle and Nissan, and just all these major when brands. Pro- and- I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm really interested in in what that what that job entails. Like, are, when you're programming, are you uh, finding the artists that are already doing the stuff, or are you just putting it in, or what what is it? Well, this particular thing, it was a little weird because it, it was a it was a it was a startup company from the CEO owner. Well, not owner because he had sold the company to Omnicom at that point, but um, it's just a global marketing agency called GMR Marketing that okay. was eventually purchased by Omnicom. Um, you know, multi, multi million dollar. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, I've heard that company for sure. The, the owner of the company, Gary Michael Reynolds, GMR. Um, he was a big music fan, and he had this idea, which, which in theory was was very interesting. And it was his thoughts on it were, all right, Bob Seger, for instance, is going to license like a rock for a you know or sorry uh, ford is going to let me see bob seger like a rock right i got you right so and they're going to spend tens hundreds of thousands of dollars to Mm -hmm. license like a rock well gary's idea was all right ford why would you pay bob seger to license like a rock when we could find you an up-and-coming artist or even an established artist that would write you your own song that has that same sentiment and you could be a part owner in it. So now every time you run your ads for the new Ford truck, instead of Bob Seger making money and you spending money on Bob Seger, you can actually generate revenue from the royalties of a master that you own it. Mm -hmm. Um, And originally I could see some good and bad in there. (laughs) <laughs> yes agreed and i was the same way because i'm an artist i was like all right I said, I said, yeah that's what i'm thinking i'm like ooh. <laughs> i was like there's, there's two problems with this first one is that the reason you license bob seger's like a rock is because it's got a connection to people already and right. people react to those notes and to, and it's proven uh, and then the next problem with this is is there's not as much money in music publishing as you think mm-hmm. like there's music there's there's money in the licensing fee that Ford would pay to Bob Seger, but that little jingle getting played on TV, like, yeah, it does. Yeah. It does equate to revenue, but it's not life changing money. So right. that's, so that's one of those I, things. A lot of people wouldn't realize that aren't in the, but yeah, right. absolutely. So when I, when, so when I first was offered the opportunity to work with this company, it was predicated on helping to build this library and being the, the, the executive producer of putting all of this together. And, I, and I, I was at a point in my touring career where I was like, you know what? I could use a break. It was when I first started to to realize some of the things we talked about earlier where I needed to like remove myself from certain energies and like this mm-hmm. would be good for me to like not tour for a couple of years and, and go down this rabbit hole. And um, I was offered, a, you know, a really respectable amount of money to do it. Um, so. So that was when I was working on programs with the NFL and Major League Baseball. And we were creating with a, with a network of artists, all of this original music that they were then incorporating into their game days and so on and so forth. And, and long story short, the idea really didn't work um, for a lot of the reasons that I anticipated early on. But again, you know, this is a hundred million dollar man sitting across the table from me going like, dude, I built this hundred million dollar marketing company and I believe inherently in my plan and I'll get the brands to pony up the money for it. So don't worry about that. You worry about the creative and let me worry about this. And I was like, all right, that I'll, I'll trust you. I'll ride yeah. your, your, Why your ride. You? Let's see where it goes. So after a couple years, I started getting pulled into meetings where he go like, Edsel, yeah, brother, we got to find some revenue. And I was like, I fucking told you like <laughs> this was going to be the problem. 
So long story short, um, we had such a strong personal relationship between us and we become such good friends. And I had become very comfortable at his marketing agency as well, because this company that, that did all the music was sort of a side spinoff of the marketing agency where we use some of the resources and the relationships of the marketing agency, but it wasn't the agency. Okay. Um, so when he kind of started realizing that like, all right, maybe we need to rethink this or maybe this isn't going to work. It, it it was really awesome because our friendship had him going like, but I don't want to lose you on my team. He's like, I want to start bringing you into GMR things now. I want you to start working on, on marketing campaigns. And we're doing this thing with American Horror Story. And I think you should be part of that. And I was like, all right, this is a transition. But it, actually, this is more exciting for me because I'm kind of burnt on music. And I would rather work on, on programs that are just actually marketing programs. So um, I won't bore you with the details. But one of the coolest things we worked on, we had like a quarter million dollar budget from American Horror Story to create what they call the experience. And this was during um, the Asylum series for American oh, Horror yeah. Story. And they were like, all right, all right, we're, we're just going to create a, an online contest and there's going to be five winners. And we want to run them through a, a living, breathing, virtual haunted house. And we're like, all right. And what do we, we got? It was more than a quarter million dollars to spend. And literally, it's so sad because for whatever reason at that time, like we filmed it, but but it wasn't we weren't in control to say, like, let's film this so that we can really exploit it and share it because that wasn't what the, the the brand wanted to do. The brand literally yeah. wanted to create this experience for five people to go through, put some online content up and then move on. So we rented out this abandoned asylum in up, upstate New York and literally I, I, as the creative director of this project, got to turn this place into an asylum that five people flew in from various parts of the country. We picked them up in a security van with with um, with bars in the back and had a an actor playing a mental patient, freaking out, telling them, like, whatever you do, don't let them take you there. You think this is a, a, you think this is fun, but this is real. This is real. You're going. You're going to die. Wow. <laughs> and they took these five people to this asylum. And as soon as they got there, we took their phones. We had really large orderlies there. Like you know, we planned this thing out to a T. Took their phones, put them in scrubs, and then put them in wheelchairs and wheeled them around all these different experiments. And we had moles in there, so there were five contestants, and then we had three moles that we hired. And one of them was like. One of those like um, circus performer dudes that like, you know, would 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 like, you know, put freaking needles through his arms and all this kind of shit. So so uh, one example that we did is we brought all of them into this classroom and we had uh, this, you know, well-trained German accented doctor talking to them about hypnotism and then called up one of the moles and said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to show you the experiment that all seven or eight of you are going to go through. Called this mole up to the front of the, of the, of the, of the room, hypnotized him fakely, and then had this dude like jamming needles through his arm and through his cheek. And as this is happening, one of our orderlies is walking around to everybody in the room and like taking alcohol and dabbing it on their arm. And dude, we fucking freak these people <laughs> out like when this when sounds they, awesome dude it was so much fun so after five hours of them going through this experience like they literally and it was all timed out like literally when they ended this thing they were running as fast as they can for the door while somebody was chasing them with you know thinking they were going to die thinking that it was real Whoa. when originally they signed up for some contest to win a tv show so <laughs> So I it's a hell that of a doing... contest that they signed up for, man. Yeah, <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> I so, love that. I love that shit, though. That sounds yeah. That it sounds was like so. It was fun, so man. so much fun, and you can actually probably Google it, like American Horror Story: so they, The Experience. Yeah, so you could probably see this, is what you're saying, like in its entirety. You think? No, no, no. Yeah. You can see it like that, and that's that was the disappointing part of it, is that we right. didn't film it for consumption like that because right. that wasn't what American Horror Story was interested in. So right, it wasn't right, right. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. They were like, don't don't waste money on a camera crew to do all this because we only need this much to show people on the internet. They were like, spend all the money on the experience. So 
really like which is cool that's, that's that's a really cool way to go it about is. it too yeah so, so but literally like five people got to go through this quarter million dollar haunted house that we built wow. and it, it lasted one day and then we tore it all down and it was fucking done it's just crazy wow. that's but, that's um, really cool but also almost a waste i'm like fuck man yeah, like, i agree <laughs> i agree so, dude we built i want to go i want to go through the motherfucker now <laughs> i was like dude if only i had more time i could have shot five music videos in the place just no, because it was shit. all lit so well and we had all the production there and like so yeah definitely a missed opportunity in that regard but but so so after the the music publishing company thing kind of fell to the wayside and i became part of the marketing team that was you know probably the funnest project i got to work on i, I worked on a bunch of other things too but but um the way it, it, it ended for me was i i kind of like realized like all right if this is my future if I want to be a marketing guy now, I want to work at an agency, whether it's this one or another one, it occurred to me, like, I really had to become one of them. Like I was going to have to like, the, the company was in Milwaukee and I lived in Chicago. So it was like an hour drive. I was going to have okay. to like move to Milwaukee, become one of these dudes. And to me, I equated it to like, all I could see in my head was like, here lies Edsel. Like it felt like a tombstone. Like I'm going to move to Milwaukee and become a marketing guy. Like yeah. that, I'm not ready for that. So I had a great conversation with the, you know, the CEO owner who was my friend. I was like, bro, I love you, but like, this isn't my life. Like, I don't want to be a marketing guy. Like the adventure that you and I started to do and build together, it didn't work out. And I'm grateful that you offered me this other opportunity to, as like a, 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 a consolation prize. And, and I accepted it for a period of time, but I think I need to move on. And we'll stay friends forever, and we still are to this day, and and that was all good. But it just wasn't where I saw my life going. So when I made the decision to move to LA, it was predicated on leaving that job, getting rid of the prescription meds that I had been on and off of for two years of my life, and then my personal relationship at the time. I, in many ways, like it wasn't going to withstand me going back on the road because that was what brought so much damage to the relationship to begin with. So, wow. and a lot of why being at home and having this corporate job made sense for what my life was. So I really made a decision that like, I was completely starting over. I was going to move. I was going to leave the relationship. I was going to leave uh, the, the meds. I was going to leave the job. And I was going to get in the car and I was going to drive west and I was going to start over. And that was, you know, Drama Club. And that led into Blood Money Part One, which yeah. led into Blood Money Part Zero. And, um, and then there's the Static X thing that I produced and did the whole time. And like, it's it's been crazy 10 years, but all the right decisions to get the fuck out of that miserable winter hell of Chicago, which served me very great for many, many years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could never could never live there again. Wow, man, that's that's a that's an incredible journey to come back to. And I just wanted I wanted to get back to uh, Echo Studios just for a couple of things sure. that, that I that I was putting a pin in. But uh, uh, are you getting a lot of uh, or has it come up yet that you're getting clients for like live uh, holographic performances or anything like that? Have you done any of the mapping for that? No, um, but. You can look one of them up that's really cool. You can look up a virtual concert with Madison Beer. Madison, She's a like yeah. like a pop star, like a, like kind of like a Disney pop star kind of thing. Um, and what they did is they put together a virtual concert for Madison Beer at Sony Hall, where they went in and scanned the interior of Sony Hall, and then we did the scans of Madison, and then the Sony Hyper Real team put together a literal virtual concert. Everything you watch when you go to this making of Madison Beer virtual concert, you're going to see her performing at Sony Hall, but it's not her. It's a digital, it's her digital double. Wow. So, that's, so something I would, really, I, that's something I could throw on uh, my, uh, correct. my my Oculus and watch. Okay. And dude, like the future of that is going to be bananas, bro, because yeah, I'm really excited for it, man. That's why I had to grab one. One of my friends showed me an Oculus dude, and I was like, this is just and, too and, cool. And the future of virtual concerts is very interesting. And, and I'm not really into it personally. Like, it's not my thing, but you can't stop the, kids, the train. You can't stop. And the kid going back to yeah, this dude. new generation, I mean, you're not going to, this is what they're, bro, this is what they love, man. And dude, I'm going to take it a step further just in like the, the, the weirdness of it, which is the part I really can't relate to. So let's start mm. here. Let's say, I don't care who it is. Let's say it's fucking, let's say it's Madison Beer. Okay. Who's a, you know, big star. So this girl or, or, yeah, so so Madison Beer is doing a virtual concert or XYZ artist. 
and everybody can put on their Oculus and they can watch it. Okay. Well, eventually they're going to sell tickets for that shit. It's not going right. to just be like, Hey, come to this. So, so then it's going to be, well, where do you want your ticket to allow access to? Do you want to be side stage in your Oculus where you're like watching her and like, or do you want to be on the stage? Because no one else will be able to see you on the stage. You can just literally like be right up in her face. Um, what kind of access do you want? And then it it starts to become, and this is the part that where it gets a little scary. Um, so let's say Kim Kardashian is side stage at the Madison Beer virtual concert. And you're front row at the Madison Beer virtual concert. And you can look and you can see on the side of the stage that Kim Kardashian is there. Okay. Well, she's wearing virtual Fendi sunglasses and she's holding a virtual Gucci bag and she's wearing whatever labels she's wearing for clothing. Those are all eventually going to be things that people are going to covet and they're going to want to buy. Right. So now, just like they do when they play Call of Duty and they buy the skin or whatever they buy yeah, for 100%. their... It, dude, t 20 years from now, people are going to be living in their Oculuses and they're going to be spending all their money on their bling that's not even real. Right. Like, because... But it, it is it, real to them. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a devil's advocate to that too. You're not going to be able to change that like that. 100%. And, and, that and is we their reality and their perspective. And, and it's how we express ourselves. Whether, you know, some people express themselves with a Raiders hat. Mm -hmm. which probably only costs you 40 bucks, which is cool. Some people feel like they need to wear some expensive brand to show their status and that they can afford it. Right. But all that will enter into the digital world where you'll be paying money for a Raiders hat virtually, or you'll be paying money for silver teeth or for this, like I said, a Fendi bag that's like not even a real Fendi bag, but because you want to show people, you want to flex in the metaverse, right. you're going to have to pay the license for that Fendi bag. Like that shit is where my mind disconnects and goes, no. Well, but do you have that in the come. real world? But do you disconnect yourself from that in the real world? Real world? Because I, I just want to point out that that's, the reason why I, I don't have too much of a problem with it because it'll eventually correct itself. There are people who will seek a, seek out that uh, that flex, and there'll be other people who don't. They will still uh, coexist in the virtual world at some point, much like we do in the real world. There are people out there, as you described, that want the Gucci bag. They want all this shit, and more power to them. But there's other people who don't give a, that don't give a flying fuck about that. Hundred percent. So what? Where I'm? Where I guess my my question or my pushback on that is is like, isn't it interesting though that we see it in the virtual world and it's like, well, what the fuck is that? But we're neglecting that that's exactly how it is in the real world right now. 100%. And that that's my point. And, and that's why I'm actually, maybe I came off uh, not the way I intended. I wasn't knocking it. I'm oh, okay. more. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Where I'm going with it, it's mind blowing that, that we're going to be conditioned that if you want to represent yourself and for a lack of better words, flex in the metaverse or express mm -hmm. yourself in the metaverse in the virtual world, you're going to be spending money that you make in the real world, or I guess you make your money in the virtual okay, yeah, world. Yeah, there's too. gonna be a, plenty of jobs over there too, man. <laughs> yeah, but, but you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be expressing yourself through digital objects that mm -hmm. people can see your avatar sporting or it, it's just it's crazy. That's the I point agree. I'm trying to make. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. And and I, forgive me crazy. if I wasn't understanding your your point there earlier, but yeah, I I agree. It's it's hard for me to wrap my head around for guys like us who, uh, it's a generational thing, I think. And, totally. And it's going to be hard for us to wrap our minds around. And I just try, you know. And and to my and you best have a about, five year old, right? I have a five year old. Yes. Imagine when he's twenty five. I that's that's all Imagine. I can think about. And I'm like, that's and dude, be and when his and when if he has a kid at twenty five thirty, and his kid is five, like that 100%. shit. It's just now, like we haven't even scratched the surface. Right. Like it's gonna be banana land. And the yeah, and the and you could look at graphs even from ten years ago that that show the exponential growth in in technology and stuff that has uh, jumped all these things. And and I understand that, but it is also true that our parents looked at us in in a lot of fashion like that. So it's like it's not like it's new. Like a lot of people, are no, like, oh my really? god, this is like oh my god, can you believe it? And it's like, yes, totally, because yeah, it's totally. happened before, just in a very di it's in a new way. Yes, but this is something totally. that is not that is not lost on me. That is, and that's why I just you. 
I try to understand it to the best of my ability. I will never understand it like my son or like someone of that generation. They will always understand it more uh, than I ever than I can ever comprehend it. But I do see I'm, I I have an Oculus. I enjoy it. Like I have games. I have other things to do, and I, I think it's cool. Could I see myself falling into that pit? Probably not. But I mean, like that's. I could see how easy it could be the other way, and I could also see how it would be perceived as not a pit. It could be, so, you know, you're, there is always going. It's not like, look, when uh, when things come out new, they don't necessarily eradicate the old. You know what I mean? Like, like we have TVs. We're we're talking about technology of virtual right now, and people are still buying hard copies of books and reading books, or just getting them on their Kindle. People are still doing that. It didn't eradicate them. It just sure. it just there's new stuff as well. So I feel that that's kind of more. A lot of people get scared or worried, or I, I you know, I don't really know because I don't watch or listen to the whole conversations. I'll I'll be honest, but I see like some of those hits that are like. Oh, you got to watch out for the for these virtual people in this virtual world. I'm like, I don't see what the big deal is. I mean, like at first it's going to seem really fucking weird and it's going to be a transition. It's going to be hard for people to grasp and just like everything else. But eventually it's going to all the kinks are going to get worked out. Like everyone gets so sure. upset about the kinks. I'm like, what you're describing is kinks that happen in every new progression in, in technology. Like this yeah, is 10 years new. from now. Shit's going to be just going to be so different. Like, right. For for me, um, I think where my where I get excited in the not, like, not in the way that that is like positive, but where I get excited about it and I go like no, and I, I act animated is more based on looking at it from the business standpoint because my company are all we focus on is digital humans, like that's mm -hmm. all, and we're never gonna focus on anything else because I want to be the best at one thing. I want to be the best at what we do. Um, but when I think about the business and I think about how our assets are going to be used, and then I look at like that Madison Beer virtual concert that we were part of, and and then my creative marketing brain starts to go. That's where I start going, holy shit, this is never ending. Like mm -hmm. this is going to become like all of the things that human beings do to express themselves in this world are we'll going to hundred percent, hundred percent, and and, and, and more part, and more yes. probably. Dude, and, and I will, and I will bet you that like, and I never even thought about it till just this minute talking to you. Like, I'm looking at your tattoos, and I'm going, "Can you get a virtual tattoo from Paul Booth in the metaverse someday?" Absolutely. Of course you will. You'll be able to buy. Of the course, art, you're, and you'll be able to swap it out. Or will buy the. Art and by exactly. the way, that's not necessarily a bad thing. How often have you been like, "Man, I wish I could swap this tattoo out every once in a while." Not forever, but like, I want to. I, I ran out of I space. It. I want to put something else there. <laughs> I get it. So it's just so so the part that's mind blowing for me is how much how much of people's revenue I think they're going to at some point certain people not all but but a lot of people's money is going to go into the skinning and the presentation of their virtual life. Mm -hmm. As much so as maybe their real life and again it all just depends on how much it becomes accepted. If 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 having your virtual representation of yourself is what you're allowed to walk into a business meeting on Zoom as, then I guess it's worth it to invest. I think invest. eventually it probably will be unless something else Who comes. knows? But here's the thing. I mean, we are a very accepting society nowadays. Right, right, like, right, right. Who's to tell me that I don't identify as a fucking avatar 10 years from now? Like, I, who the fuck knows? Well, we don't know that. and on, the, But what we also don't know is what's coming next. Like totally. we, we're talking about something that like is is so foreign to us right now in 10 15 years we'll be looking at it and going oh there's this new thing now whatever the totally. fuck that is there's a there's another step there's always there's constant growth in technology and I'm, I'm sure I'm uh, um, preaching to the choir here right I mean obviously with with echo studios you you guys are right it's in the bananas, thick of it, dude. so it's fucking bananas and I'm so grateful to be part of something that like is so outside of music and also in and I you know, I say this respectfully, it's a fucking growth industry. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, when I got into the music business, 25, I got signed in 1998 to Epic Records. There was publishing deals and there was still MTV. And there was like, my my album came out on cassette. Wow. There yeah. was the 
the the financial model of the music. and not and not to be and not to be nostalgic it came out on cassette because that's what was fucking getting played in cars right <laughs> now they still, I came out on CD too but like my yeah, first album was released on both back to it didn't um, squash it right away <laughs> right dude it's crazy so so when I think back to like the the business model the revenue of what the music business was when I got into it and then I lived through every facet of it and I have you know like and and you know there was a time when everybody thought you know Napster and streaming was going to kill the industry, and for a little while it kind of did, it, especially if you were an independent artist. Um, so here we are now; it's twenty plus years later, and and it is what it is. And I think that if you're a new artist today, man, opportunities are actually pretty amazing. If you're Fucking if you're a man, there yeah, is if so you're connected cool to shit a, out there now. And if, and if you're connected to a youthful audience mm -hmm. and I, and I, that's one of the things that, and again, I don't say this to, to cry. I say it to just be factual. Like my band dope. I'm very grateful for, for what it is, but I also know what it is. Like I know what my demographic is. And for me to put a bunch of energy or time or money into trying to rebrand it and market it to a 16 year old would be foolish. Mm. Um, so, but at the same time, that means that there are limitations to it. That means that, like, I understand that the demographic of the person that that interacts with my band, they mostly use social media in a way that, like, you know, they're they're going on Facebook to share pictures from their kids' t-ball game. Mm -hmm. They're not using Facebook or TikTok or Instagram the way a 16 year old does, which is the way that our fans back in 1999 used Metal Edge magazine or Alternative Press magazine. Like they use social media as a way to consume and find new passion and points of art and bands and so on and so forth. Well, that's not me. They're not going to find me on a on a large scale. Some 16 year old might find me, but my fan base is not going to be reignited because of, of, uh, of social media. But if I was a, a 22 year old artist putting out my first album, dude, I don't know that there's ever been a better time because that unlike them, reach. dude, it's so like for me, dude, when I was in, in 1999, I had a fucking, I had a clipboard at the merch booth. It said, please sign up with your email address, which, you know, it was an AOL email address and they've changed since then. And then when I got dropped from a major label in 2002, two, three years into it, um, like I had no ability to connect with my fans. I, could, I didn't have a major label entity anymore. Mm. I didn't have the radio stations. I didn't have the age. I had nothing. So I was like, how do I find them? The only was go back on the road and, and play a little club. <laughs> that's it. That's but the way like, to do it. <laughs> but, but nowadays it's like, boom, you like my band? Okay, cool. You've you've hit the button and you've subscribed. And now, you know, I have however many thousand followers. And today I'm I'm gonna go on print on demand and I'm gonna create a new t shirt design and I'm gonna say only one hundred available and I could sell them in a day. Like right. I, I I you know, like and and I look at a guy like Ronnie Radke, who again I'm a big fan of, and he's a super super cool dude. And I just think of the of that dude's business model because of his um, his instantaneous access and connectivity to his fan base is something I could have never imagined having as a young artist connected to a young fan base. So I think for 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 new artists, they're living in the best time they could ever live in. I agree. Um, for me as an older artist, not the best time that you could ever live in. <laughs> I'm glad you brought um, I'm glad you came back to that though cuz I wanted to say like that uh, it is it's a growing pain and it, and it, and it just as it says in the word pain uh but there is time to uh try and try and drag some of those people through yes. because it's going to happen. Like sure. just like just like streaming. I mean, as you know in the rock sure. world, we were our genre was the last genre to uh, to embrace the the, the streaming platforms, sure. and it's and it showed on the on every single number. <laughs> but, well, and, and I'll take that a step further, and I'll say that like that that uh, that I'm I'm also grateful for the things I got that the new bands today don't like. I was on MTV at three o'clock in the afternoon, right? And that, that was like a cool experience in itself and the major label push and all those things that we got to participate in that don't really exist anymore. Um, but what got me on this subject was yes, you know, the modern day music business is not ideal, 
for someone in my position in the music business. But that's why I'm very grateful that I have used my business experience and my relationships and my all the skills that I've learned as an independent DIY producer, team builder, and so on and so forth to now have have been able to invest all of that knowledge and time and experience into a different business that has nothing to do with music because the the tech world that I'm in with echo is a growth industry. And it is something that I feel like I can, when I do put a 12 hour day in, I go, this can translate to the type of return that I think I'm worthy of. And that will ultimately affect my life and my kids' life and the things that are are important to me moving forward and hopefully retiring here at some point. Mm. Um, and when I say retiring, I mean, for me to retire, it means that I no longer have to do things I don't feel like doing. Um, I'm always going to work because I'm, I'm in passion to work. But there are a lot of things that I currently have to do on a daily basis that I go, if I had, you know, fuck you money, I wouldn't do that anymore. There's yeah. certain things that I would just go. Like I don't have out, to do like it. clean up the dog shit in the in the in the courtyard, you know. <laughs> sure, um, <laughs> but, but I, I even more just mean in business. No, I like, know, I know what you mean. I'm, 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 being, I'm being cheeky, as the uh, Brits would say. Yes, yes, a hundred percent. So I'm very grateful for that, and you know, and it's also like the business that I'm in at Echo. It's it's very, um, it's an ethical business, dude. Like yeah. I don't have to chase people down to pay me. Yeah. I, I I'm not like. How, you know, I don't want to get into a whole nother side of the dark side of the music business, but Jesus Christ, dude, like when anybody owes you money in music, you generally have to chase them for it. And then they generally, once, once you do corner them and go, Hey, how about that money you owe me? They go, well, it didn't do as well as we thought it would do. So how about we just give you a fraction of what we originally agreed to? It's like, how the fuck does that work? Like, didn't we make an agreement and shake hands and sign on the dotted line? And now you know, because it's the music business, um, you know, it's uh, there's you ever you remember the movie Swimming with Sharks? Yeah. All right. Fun movie. There's a line that I'll never forget. And it was based on the movie business, but it's just as relevant in the music business. They were like, this is the this is this is the movie business hitting below the belt isn't only expected. It is rewarded. Yeah. Like. It's just, you know, the ethics of the music business are very questionable and they have been forever. And, um, since the beginning, and I, yeah, and I've learned to deal with it and I'm very good at it. Um, but uh, I'm very grateful that I have found other ways in my life to, to also have businesses and, and revenue streams that aren't tied to it, that are in more ethical, more traditional ways of doing business where it just feels, you know, not like the experience is part of the reward. You know, for a long time, we're all conditioned as artists to be like money. We're going to give you girls and drugs and tr- crowds of people to play in front of money. Like, don't, don't worry about the money. We'll take care of the money for you. Like, yeah. Okay, sure. That sounds convenient for you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, the experience, the experiential reward, uh, you know, becomes uh, not quite as important to you as as you get older. Right, you know? right, right. That goes back to the beginning of the conversation. Right. I mean, that's. Uh... That's kind of bringing it full circle there. Um, we could go on and on about the business side, obviously, and I'd like to. I honestly would. Let's stay in touch, Edsel. Uh, sure, there's, some, there's some cool stuff there, some things I'd like to uh, talk to you about, about uh, some ideas moving forward with, uh, you know, things you just touched upon, having to chase people in this industry and uh, sure. how I believe there are there are ways around that coming real soon. Well. You know, I, I like what you're doing, dude. I think it's re- it's really cool, like this podcast format or what do you call it? It's a show. I don't know. It's a podcast. Okay. It's a podcast. It's a podcast. Yeah. Right. So like I really like it. It's something that um I have flirted with, but I, I feel like a, a big part of doing what you do well is listening. And I'm much better at talking than I am listening. Um, so, so I, I, I appreciate what you're doing and I think you're doing a really great job at it. Um, Thank you. Appreciate it's that. nice to meet you and I will offer you uh if you ever want to talk with me again I'm always happy to do this because I've I've enjoyed myself but if you in the future because it's not for me about promoting a, a record or promoting anything I'm doing but if you want to pick subject matters where like man I just want to talk about this or that like I'll dive as deep as you want on specific things just because I get off on it like I, yeah. I like going down those rabbit holes so if you ever want to have me back just to do 
you know, things that aren't related to like pushing my that, career. I, I don't give a fuck. I just like the bullshit with people that I respect. I think, I think the fun. fans, I think the fans might like that too. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to them about it later, but I think that's a really great idea. And I appreciate that, man. I will send, yeah, uh, I'll send Kevin my number and, uh, hopefully cool. we could, we could, uh, we could stay in touch through that. Um, we actually do, uh, follow-ups the weeks that these, uh, episodes release. So, uh, cool. at least like to get you on for a, for a 15 minute phone call. Um, yeah, good luck with 15 that. minutes. Sure. <laughs> hey, however long minutes. it goes, just like this. I yeah. love it. I love it. No, I mean, you're, you're, you are, uh, great at, at, at sharing your story and I appreciate that's, that, that's why I, uh, it's a, it's a really great, interesting story and I appreciate you sharing it with me. That's why I do this show. Cause I do want to, we could go, we can go back to you know, the, the way press was done before and all that, whatever. And you could go find those things. You don't want, you, everyone wants to learn about the new single and, and, and those great things. Awesome. We're going to get to know you a little bit here and that's why yeah, I want to do it. Which I appreciate the forum to do that, man, because as, as I shared with you earlier, the, uh, the little infomercial that I put out, that was really the tone that I was trying to set. Like, and also I'm giving away the record for free. Like, right. It, like, is it a business? Sure it is. But this is more for me at this point in my life about just wanting to reestablish how the community, which is what we are, how the community uh, defines who I am. Right. Because I, I really feel like they're like most people either had an idea of who they thought I was or they had no fucking idea. And but the ones who had an idea was probably misinformed. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's just about going out and shaking hands virtually of guys like you and just going like, man, it's, you know, weird that we never cross paths enough to like become dudes, but like now we will. Yeah. And now, you know, my story and I learn a little bit about yours and, um, and I appreciate you, uh, you know, giving me a forum to speak to your fans. Like these are your oh, fans. They're, thank they're you. Thank you for being here, page, man. Brother. No, it's all so, the, like, the appreciation's all on this side, man. I, I, thank you for being here. No, we're going to fight for the appreciation <laughs> to the death. Uh, yeah, buddy. But it, it's just cool. It, you know, I, this is, this is a big part of this journey for me is just, uh, you know, reintroducing myself to the community. That's what I like to call it because that's what they are. Like the, the, the people that watch your show or that buy my records or come to my shows, like they're, they're a community of, of like-minded people that, that are into art and bands and music and, um, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to reintroduce them to who I am today because, uh, right. how, if I don't tell them how the fuck do they know? Yeah, exactly. And I haven't talked, dude, and I haven't talked to press in years. Like I've no. been so just focused on living my life and trying to succeed at things Naturally. that it hasn't, it hasn't been important to me, but yeah. it is, you know, it's, it's part of the process of letting people know that I have a new record, but I also feel like it's long overdue. And uh, and I'm I'm grateful to do it. So I appreciate that. I want to show you one thing before we're done. Absolutely, though. man. We're supposed to be mortal enemies. Uh, <laughs> what do we got here? This is oh my, my man, idea. I'm not even going to release this episode now. I had no idea that was hiding behind you. And this is this is this. I just <laughs> bought this because this is helmet. the fucking super. This is the Super Bowl team. I had every single uh, fucking guy from the Super Bowl run sign it. It hurts. Um, it hurts me to see that after I was just talking so nicely about you. Oh God, I, yeah. I got to go back and delete that part. Well, I'm gonna make you feel better. So I'm a <laughs> diehard Kansas City Chiefs fan, and I have been since I was a kid, my whole life. And dude, up until the last three years, they sucked, dude. That's we true. never won a fucking playoff game. We had Tony Gonzalez on our team who never won a playoff game. We had Joe Montana. Uh, Joe Montana. We, you did you did get to the FC championship with Montana. We did. And Marcus and, and and no that was when like my dreams were crushed. I'm the ten year old kid watching the Bills just annihilate it because because Montana just couldn't play in the cold. Yeah. Um but I always looked at that team even as like, you know, that wasn't our quarterback. That was Joe Montana. It was like it, it was you cool that he had played your for, quarterback for a, year. for a long time though. Now you sons of bitches. But dude, oh my god, the team was so bad for so long, and I had to 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 just eat it from guys like you. Eat <laughs> it, and you have cooler colors and a cool logo. I will say Al the logo is it, it can't be beat. The Raiders, logo dude, and Al Davis was so rad, and yeah. and like and now you guys are in Vegas. Like you have so much going for you, and and my team sucked my whole life, and then we got we got Andy Reid and we got Patrick Mahomes, and like you know what, dude, I'm I'm living it. But I'll end this with you, um, and and you may relate. I don't know if you, have you uh, maybe not because you. It's been a long time since your team won a Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, 
but Fuck but uh but i will tell you this there have I been so many up. times i know well i was i i kind of did a <laughs> yeah a little dig there i see what you did yeah there well, one of my best friends in the world is tony campos bass player of static x and he's a huge raider fan oh, okay, so me yeah, and yeah. have a fun thing but um but let me tell you this my my whole life i i've loved football i i love the chiefs of course and there have been many times especially during the playoffs where like the chiefs would lose a playoff game and it would like ruin my day. Like it would like sometimes <laughs> ruin like a few days. Like it was just like so disappointed in yeah, it yeah. and like soul crushing. And then we're the chiefs are playing the 49ers in the Super Bowl a couple years ago and they won the game. And I almost couldn't believe it. Cause I was like, wait a minute. Like, yeah. and then I, and then I, because I've become more self-aware, I was like, how do I feel right now? I was like, all I felt was relief. I didn't feel <laughs> joy. I didn't feel any goodness. I didn't feel happy. And I went, this uh, sucks. All the pain I felt, all the disappointment I felt, and now they finally win the big game. And I and I don't. It doesn't even feel good. All it feels is just like, whoo. I was like, fuck this. I'm never gonna let it ruin well, another Sunday. Well, we're going to stay in touch. And when I get that feeling from the Raiders after this year, uh, we'll, we'll see if we could, uh, if we have a similar feeling, right? The Super Bowl winning feeling? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, after yeah. Good luck year. with that. After, after this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you the best. But however, you're a better man than me because I'm not wishing your team the best. <laughs> this is not music, my friend. For me to win, somebody has that, to lose. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely um, right. But 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 yeah. So I, I will say this though: once they won the the Super Bowl, and I felt that feeling um, when they lost the Super Bowl uh, the year before last, and even losing to the Bengals in the AFC Championship last year, it didn't hurt as bad. No, you got, you, got, like, you got a recent chip. That's all. That's all it needs. Well, that and also I realized that when they do win, it doesn't feel that good. So I had to consciously like disconnect slightly from how I allow. I do that like that you did. I like that you described it as becoming self aware. You're yes. we're, that's way too technical. Like that's way too robotic. Like that we're, we're going to get into some AI shit this next conversation because I, I saw what you did there. Dude, self-aware is like one of the biggest a attributes I've built in myself is like being being self-aware is so, so important to your own mental true. health, yeah, yeah, the way yeah. people see you. But And I'll always have this beautiful helmet signed by all the dudes that played on my championship winning season. Um, and, and I can use know, that as a bedpan, right? I can use that as a, as a bedpan. <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah next time you come over and visit where do you live what what's what state orange, are you in uh california i'm i'm, I'm just oh, so out here orange, right, orange county orange county so, we, we'll, so we'll get we'll point. get in touch we'll get in touch in uh in person sometime here soon are you guys on tour in spring i don't know yet we're we're all right well we're, if you're not everything right now if you're not um we have a big spring tour going out uh it's static x fear factory and dope um it's going to be a sick tour and we of course play anaheim and we play san diego um so we we should meet up then i was just in in uh in orange county a, a, a couple months or a month ago three weeks ago um i was out with my dudes in static x for that freaks on parade tour with zombie and, and mudvane i wish oh, i would have yeah, known yeah, you yeah. there yeah that I was at the uh, five down. points amphitheater right yeah great 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 event great show yeah um, well but well, we'll we'll make sure we remedy that, remedy that for next time because I actually was home at that time too. So well, awesome. So yeah, well, if well, you're well, not well. on tour, it's it's at the House of Blues. So come out and and hang out with us, and uh, and I'll I'll make sure that to to pick on your your Raiders who uh, we'll by see. that point will have already have lost. Won, uh, Super Bowl. You, you probably wouldn't even, won't even make the playoffs to be honest because the division is really tough. Oh, just That's just hold, one. just hold, just. Just simmer down, all right. Just I mean, you down. did you did squeak by the Chargers in that tie game? Actually, we tried to I give know. them the fucking game, and they were too dumb to take it. So that's you know, a good point. that's so you didn't tie it, right? You kicked the field goal and the field and won, so they were out. So we made the postseason and lost by one touchdown to the team that would eventually beat yours in the AFC Championship. Yeah, that was a rough game for us, and you do have Devonte Adams now. There's a lot. There's a yep. lot. There's yep. a lot of reasons to look up and up. And hey, you if, if you're and if you're a conspiracy theorist, the Tampa Bay was the first team to have the have a Super Bowl at their home and win it last year. L.A. did it and won it. And the Vegas Raiders are hosting the Super Bowl this year. Cool. I'm gonna get my tickets early because I think the Chiefs are gonna probably be there. <laughs> You motherfucker. <laughs> you know, if Super Bowl tickets weren't so crazy expensive, like I would make you a gentleman's bet and go like, we're just going to go to the Super Bowl and whoever loses pays for it. But it's way too much fucking money. It's not even worth it.
I'm, I, I might be oh. down. We'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll, we'll, we'll continue this conversation. To be continued. And, and to be continued. Thank you so to much, Edsel Doe, for being on the show, man. We're going to stay in touch. Everyone go check out the singles that are now and how you continue to release the music through Dope and the stuff you're doing with Echo Studios is super cool, man. I appreciate the time, and uh, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, thank you, man. Sorry for the long wind that I think I took you like almost an hour past your time. But no, uh, no, you didn't take hopefully me people don't We're don't turn it off halfway through. <laughs> don't worry about that, man. Cheers, all right, man. dude. Great to meet you. Good luck with everything, man. And uh, good luck with that little five year old. I got a two year old myself, so oh, I'm man. sure good it's an amazing, that. amazing experience. I'm looking <laughs> forward to uh, to every single year that passes. It's a, a it's, new it's amazing, isn't it? So yeah, crazy, dude. crazy. We'll it's talk awesome. about that soon, man. Good, Cheers, man. brother. Have a good rest of your night. Best wishes, brother. As can be expected with some of these shows, you never really know where it's going to go. I didn't know too much about Edsel, the person before this, just knew about his work in Dope. And uh, even some of the stuff there, uh, learning about uh, you know the, the drama club and everything like that was really cool. Echo Studio stuff, his struggles of going through uh, the, uh, the, the stage personas and, and now having a kid and all these wonderful things that we just talked about. It's uh, a lot of kinship. I think we made a friend today. And thank you guys so much for checking it out. Until next time, as always, cheers.